1929, the last wild, rich year before the Great Depression. White folks still flocked to Harlem to hear Duke Ellington at the Cotton Club. In January, a baby was born in Atlanta, and its proud parents named him Martin Luther King, Jr. 1929, one out of every five blacks now lived in the North. Two and a half million blacks had left the farm and were working as tradesmen and laborers. 1929, business seemed great. For black and white people, everything looked better than ever, especially the future. Black professionals were taking hold. There were twice as many in 1929 as in 1910. A record number of black doctors, lawyers, dentists, actors, clergymen, many of them as rich and successful as their white colleagues. 1929, on Tuesday, October 29th, the future turned sour. Did you see the papers? Stock prices collapsed. Worst day in stock market's history. Billions of dollars lost. Stocks sold at any price. What do I care? I don't own any stock. Stock or no stock. After the stock market crash, jobs disappeared. Rich people who had millions found themselves in debt. Stocks that were worth $100 per share suddenly were worth only $10 a share, if that. Goodbye maids, goodbye laundresses, goodbye gardeners, goodbye chauffeurs, goodbye masseurs, goodbye stable boys. It was nice while it lasted. For black laborers, the depression made jobs unobtainable. Few found work. <laughs> There once was a time when everything was cheap But now prices nearly put a man to sleep When we pay our grocery bill We just feel like making our will Tell me how can a poor man stand such times and live New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, St. Louis Everywhere it was the same In the richest country in the world Businesses folded Farmers were forced off their land. Millions were out of work. The cities tried to provide money for relief, but funds were low and soon ran out. The federal government was no help. In Washington, President Hoover was preaching patience. Business, he said, would pick up by itself. The cities and states and private charity did what they could. In New York City, families were given $2.39 a week to live on. In Detroit, relief fell to 15 cents a day per person and soon dropped off altogether. Only one out of four people across the nation could even get relief, and the precious pennies had to go for food and fuel. Shoes and coats, beds and medicines were luxuries. If you were lucky, you could beg or steal them. If not, you had to go without food to buy them. The number one depression disease, starvation. Landlords evicted those who had no money to pay rent. Homeless and jobless, they roamed the streets or crowded into miserable lodging houses. Shacks made of tin and boards sprang up along the rivers and in vacant lots. White and black suffered, but blacks were the hardest hit. In 1931, a black journalist named Horace Caton looked up from his lunch in a restaurant on Chicago's Black South Side. A long line of blacks was marching by. Caton went outside and joined them, and later wrote an article describing their attempts to stop the eviction of a black family. I asked where we were headed for and what we would do when we got there. He looked surprised, and he told me we were marching down to put in a family who had been evicted from a house for not paying their rent. As the Negroes did not know their legal rights, the landlords would simply pitch their few belongings out of the window with no legal procedure at all. We were met at the street by two squad cars of police. The officers jumped out of their cars and told the crowd to move on. No one moved. Everyone simply stood and stared at them. One officer lost his head and drew his gun, leveling it at the crowd. You can't shoot all of us. I might as well die now as any other time. All we want is to see that these people, our people, get back in their homes. We have no money, no jobs, and sometimes no food. We've got to live someplace. We are just acting the way you or anyone else would act. Just then a siren was heard. The whisper went around. 
The riot squad was coming. Then the riot squad turned into the street, four full cars of blue-coated officers in a patrol wagon. They jumped out before the cars came to a full stop and charged down upon the crowd. One of the officers shot twice at one of the boys. The boy stumbled, grabbed his thigh, but kept on running. It was all over in a minute. When jobs were easy to come by, the black man was the last to be hired. When jobs were hard to come by, the black man was the first to be fired. For the black man, good times were no picnic, but bad times were unbearable. I was just laid off. Why? Because I wouldn't pay off the foreman. He knows us colored folks has to put up with everything to keep a job, so he asks for two or three dollars any time. And if you don't pay up, you'll get a poor paying job or a layoff. My division foreman charged me $20 one time for taking me back on after he'd laid me off. Then asked me for 15 more after I'd worked a while. I just got tired of that way of doing and wouldn't pay him. Now I'm out of a job. Before the Depression, black women could always find work as domestics. Working one day a week for five or six ladies, a cleaning woman could earn $25 a week or more, doing laundry, scrubbing floors, washing windows. This too changed. Now, there were street corner markets where black women were hired out for housework at unbelievably low rates. In rain or shine, hot or cold, they waited to work for 10, 15, or 20 cents per hour. They scrubbed floors, washed clothes, and cleaned windows. I'm looking for a bright, lively housemaid who can cook, do laundry, and the regular housework, of course. And she must have the very best of references. How much will I pay? Well, there are so many people out of work that I'm sure I can find a girl for $6 a week. Relief workers were flooded with requests for help. One black worker listened to the plea of a middle-aged black woman, mother of six. She needed food and clothes for her children. The gas had been shut off because of overdue bills. Her landlord threatened eviction in five days. Where's your husband? Can't he help? He worked in the steel mills for four or five years and was a good man. The mill closed and he was laid off. He went out early every morning and walked the streets until night looking for work. Day after day he'd done this, ever since last June. Once a man told him that he needn't trouble looking for a job as long as there are so many white men out of work. I guess us colored folks don't get hungry like white folks. He just got discouraged one day and he went out and didn't come back. He told me once that if he wasn't living at home, the welfare people would help me and the kids. And maybe he just went away on that account. The woman's husband was one of millions of tired, defeated black men. Between 1930 and 1936, almost half of America's skilled black workers lost their jobs. Black businesses too felt the squeeze. One by one, they went under. Among the hardest hit were white and black banks and insurance companies. Bank after bank was forced to close. Depositors suddenly found that the numbers in their bank books stood for nothing. As the banks closed, they dragged down dozens of insurance companies with them. The National Benefit Life Insurance Company, a black firm with offices in 28 states, was forced to shut down its business in 1933. The editor of the Chicago Defender, a black newspaper, gave this advice to his readers. Times are not what they used to be. There is no use shutting our eyes to this fact. Prosperity has gone into retirement. Our advice is for everyone to get something and hold on to it. Get it in the city if possible, but feeling this, start toward the farm before the snow flies. <laughs> How can you keep on moving unless you migrate too? They tell you to keep on moving, but migrate you must not do. Most blacks stayed in the city. They tried to live as best they could there. Farmers had it equally hard. They suffered from low crop prices and rising costs. Bad as the Depression was for northern blacks, it was still worse in the South. I ain't got no cheerin. Me and my husband works a one-horse farm, and we got about 30 acres. But last year, we made six bales of cotton and rented the 30 acres for $60. 15 acres we use for cotton, 
the rest for corn. We kept the corn and didn't sell none, hardly. At 10 cents a pound, the six bales would bring $300. We had $10 advance for four months. We turned it all over and they took out the $40 advances, $30 for fertilizer, and $60 for rent. We got through and then they say we come out $72.43 in the hole. We just work by the day and pay $1.50 a month for this house. I get 50 cents a day and my husband and the boy get 65 cents a day. We have to feed ourselves and pay rent out of that. I know we've been beat out of money direct and indirect. You see, they got a chance to do it all right because they can overcharge us and all that's been done. I made three bills last year. He said I owed 400 at the beginning of the year. Now, you can't dispute his word. When I say, sir, he said, don't you dispute my word. The book says so. Unorganized black farmers could do little in the South. In the North, blacks began to get together to pressure whites for jobs. Brothers, sisters, I say don't buy where you can't work. These stores, they take our money, but they won't give us jobs. A white man who has a store in a colored neighborhood and who won't hire colored clerks is committing a crime, a crime against the community. That was Safi Abdul Hamid, born Eugene Brown. He spoke from a stepladder on Harlem's Lenox Avenue and was wearing a turban, green velvet blouse, and black cape with a red lining. Millions of dollars. That's what the black man spends in these white stores. They take the Negro's money, but they won't give him a job. Much of what Suffy said was true. Blomstein's, Harlem's largest department store, refused to hire blacks as clerical workers or sales girls. The unions were no help either. Except for the United Mine Workers, most trade unions didn't want black members. In 1936, 24 international unions did not accept black workers. One labor union continued to fight for better wages and working conditions for its black members. The Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids organized in 1925 by A. Philip Randolph. But one union could do little for the millions of jobless blacks. What was the result of this terrible unemployment? Here's how Roy Otley, a black writer, described New York's Harlem. He could have been talking about Chicago's South Side, Pittsburgh's Hill District, or Cleveland's Huff. The crashing drop of wages drove Negroes back to the already crowded hovels east of Lenox Avenue. And many blocks, old-fashioned toilets rarely flushed. And when they did, often overflowed onto the floor below. In winter, gaping holes in the skylight allowed coal air to sweep down the staircase. Coal grates provided the only heat. More than half the Negro families were forced to take in lodges to augment the family's income. Frequently, whole families slept in one room. Envied was a family who had a night worker as a lodger. He would occupy the bed in the day that would be rented out at night. Same room, same bed, same sheets, same bed bugs. This was described as the hot bed. Hunger and hopelessness grew in the black ghettos. So did tension and anger. The explosion finally came on March 19, 1935. It began in a five and 10 cent store on Harlem's West 135th Street. You, boy, I saw you take that. Put it back. I, I didn't take nothing. Yes, you did. I saw you take a penknife off the counter. Mr. Jones, grab him. You, where are you running? Let me go, let me go. Don't you hit me. You little animal. Let me go. What's he doing to that boy? Let him go, mister. He didn't do nothing. Let me go. The rumor spread through Harlem that the black boy had been beaten to death, and area residents rushed to the scene. By five of uniformed police, plain clothesmen, and mounted police charged. Police even drove their squad cars onto the sidewalks to chase the crowds home. 
But instead of leaving, the crowd broke into bands that surged through the streets. On Lenox Avenue, looters with loaded arms raced out of shattered shop windows. At least 200 white-owned stores were smashed and looted. Three blacks were dead. 30 people hospitalized for bullet wounds, knife cuts, and fractured skulls. More than 200 people were treated for minor injuries. Over 100 people, mostly blacks, were arrested. The total property damage, more than $2 million. In 1937, a coordinating committee for the employment of Negroes was founded. A speaker told a meeting. We will force the electric company to give us jobs. We will boycott. One night a week, everyone in Harlem will light his apartment with two cent candles. What if it doesn't work? Then we'll disrupt their offices. We'll hold a bill payers parade. Hundreds of people will march to the offices at once and pay their bills in nickels and pennies. The group had few successes. So it planned tougher moves. At a mass meeting, the young, handsome minister of Harlem's Abyssinian Baptist Church called for action. His name, Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. Harlem is sick and tired of promises. The hour is struck to march. And march they did to City Hall, to utility company offices, to the telephone company, to factories, to department stores. But jobs came slowly when they came at all. Whites weren't ready to accept the idea of black and white laborers working side by side. Negroes and whites just won't work together. Negroes and whites do work together. They're working together in plants like Ford, Kelsey Hayes, the Murray Corporation, Bethlehem Shipbuilding, and the Denver Ordnance Plant, in the shipyards of Virginia, North Carolina, and in the iron and coal fields of Alabama. Negroes just can't do the work. The Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company employs more than 6,000 Negroes as machine operators, outside machinists, stage builders, and a dozen other skilled jobs. If Negroes get the training, they can do any and all types of production jobs. But arguments and logic were tossed aside as the Depression got worse. There weren't enough jobs to go around for whites or blacks. In October 1933, Two out of every five blacks in many cities were on relief. In southern cities, it was worse. 65% of Atlanta's blacks needed public aid. In Norfolk, Virginia, no fewer than four out of every five blacks were on relief. By 1934, more than twice as many blacks as whites were jobless. The figures tell the story of depression suffering. Whites without jobs, 17%. Blacks without jobs, 38%. The poor got poorer, black and white. Discrimination continued. Blacks stood in segregated bread lines and ate in segregated soup kitchens. For many blacks, the Depression made it clear that America's high ideals reached white citizens first and black citizens second, if at all. Pushed by anger and bitterness, the nation's blacks saw that their votes might give them more power to change things and they began to use their votes to do just that. Mm -hmm. 